Poulin is the uh, group director uh, for vision and AI products at Cadence, uh, where he's in charge of the product marketing, product management, and the business development for uh, Tensilka DSPs uh, for vision and AI. Uh, they're very popular IP cores for embedded vision, mobile, uh, AR, VR, automotive surveillance cameras, and, and many other applications. And he'll be uh, he'll be making a new uh, product announcement this morning. So uh, I'll turn it over to you, Poulin. Good morning, Mike, and everyone. Uh, thanks uh, for uh, attending this morning's uh, session. So as uh, Mike said, I am a part of uh, uh, Tensilica Group at Cadence, and I run product marketing and management for our vision and AI IP. So Tensilica Group uh, uh, provide IP, our processor and DSP IP. So our customers are shipping over 7 billion processors annually. We are number one in terms of DSP IP and we are number two in our process IP in terms of licensing revenue. 19 out of top 20 semiconductor vendors are our customers. We have over 300 worldwide licensees and over 200 software ecosystem partners. As Mike mentioned, we've been in the Vision DSP market for a long time. We have customers in all this market, automotive, robotics, drone, mobile AR, VR, surveillance. So on this slide, I'll spend some time talking about some of the trends we see. In automotive, robotics, and drone, we see different kinds of sensors being used. Um, we know that image sensors, LiDAR, radar, mobile and AR, VR, 3D sensor like time of flight, multiple image sensors. And one of the big trends we've been seeing for so many years that large number of sensors are being used. When the first uh, uh, mobile phone came out with one camera in early 2000, since then, large number of sensors are being uh, used on mobile platform, but uh, not only on the mobile platform, but like I was uh, reading an article that one of the AR platform uh, might have 14 to 15 cameras, similar things. Uh, uh, are happening on the automotive platform. We also see uh, high frames per second, uh, video rates going from uh, 30 frames per second to 60 frames per second or even higher, video resolution going from uh, uh, 1080p to 4K, 8K. And now when you have all these different sensors, there's a need for sensor fusion, 3D point, 3D cloud capture, 3D point capture uh, cloud, we also see another trend is an always on island on the mobile platforms. We'll talk more about that later on. And then we are in computer vision where there's a lot of com computational imaging algorithms being used. So we take an example here of some of the uh, computational vision algorithm like multi-frame high dynamic range, super resolution imaging, bokeh effect, or when we look at uh, something like uh, SLAM simultaneous localizers and then mapping where 3D object detection and tracking is being used, trajectory estimation. And if we look underneath this algorithm, uh, under the hood, we are doing feature detection, descriptor matching, perspective transformation, various different filters. And those algorithm, when we run it on today's uh, uh, Vision DSPs in VGA resolution, you could do that in probably 30 to 20 to 30 milliseconds per frame. But as you go into HD resolution, um, this will take more than 200 milliseconds per frame, and this requires a new um, uh, Vision DSP architecture. As uh, I mentioned earlier, that there is a trend for multiple sensors in all this market, and that requires sensor fusion. And when we look at uh, some of the sensor fusion algorithm, they are floating point heavy and in algebra uh, heavy, and um, in the 3D capture use cases, you know, uh, it 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 is all those algorithms are also floating point in linear algebra heavy. So now we switch the subject and talk about always on. So when you take a look at something like a mobile platform, there is no need to wake up a main CPU uh, like a, a main CPU a compute complex display modem until a user is authenticated, and you will authenticate a user 
by let's say a voice command, a face detection, a fingerprint recognition under the glass sensor. And this re usually requires some type of a, a combination of um, uh, vision and AI, you know, if you're doing face detection and, and face recognition. So what you would have is uh, something in microwatt that's detecting activities, and then you go into milliwatt to run authentication and then uh, wake up rest of the device. So this is what we are talking about an always on island. And then there's another trend we see is smart sensors, which is a low power, low energy, always on battery powered, which is a very specific vision plus AI workload uh, for AI IoT, where you see smart doorbells or camera for object detection in kitchen or smart locks or smart printers for authentication. So these are all the devices where they, there is a specific vision plus AI workload. They may be doing a one specific workload, but you are doing processing closer to the sensor and, and that requires a vision plus AI. So now let me jump into a specific product that we introduced yesterday. So we announced our seventh generation flagship 10 silica vision Q8 and vision P1 DSP. With the introduction of these two new DSP, uh, uh, two new Vision DSP, we offer a complete portfolio from high end 3.8 tops to low end 400 giga ops. Our seventh generation flagship 10 silica Vision Q8 DSP is a 1024 bit SIMD. It is targeted at high end mobile and high resolution, high end automotive market. It offers 2X computer vision, AI, and floating point performance compared to previous generation Vision Q7 DSP. Single core offers 3.8 tops performance and 192 giga flops floating point performance for single precision floating point. And our Vision P1 DSP is 128 bit CMD machine. It's targeted for always on application and smart sensors, offers one third area and power compared to our highly successful Vision P6 DSP and get, uh, offers greater than 0.256 tops AI performance. And both of these Vision DSPs are based on same. SIMD and VLIW architecture and instruction set used by our highly successful Vision P6 and Q7 DSP. So our customer can use the same software tools and library from low end to the high end of DSP portfolio to have access to our same software past, uh, partners and thus have a fast time to market. Now let me go into more detail of, of some of this platform um, DSP. So all our DSP IP have a, a very common platform. Uh, we offer this IP that sits on AXI uh, interface, apology, uh, a, um, AXI interface. And um, uh, it uh, uh, has a DMA interface, um, 128, 256. Our VLIW machine is a five slot VLIW machine, it's four channel DMAs, a dual load store um, and scatter gather uh, uh, is common across all of our platform. And the custom instruction with tie, Tensilica instruction extension. So Tensilica, uh, in uh, Thai, this is what Tensilica was founded on. So we've been doing this thing for over 20 years where all our uh, processor and all our DSP, our customer can use Tensilica instruction extension and expand uh, the processor by adding their own uh, instruction set and optional 14, uh, vector 14 point unit. Now let me uh, uh, go more in, in our uh, um, uh, Vision Q8. So Vision Q8, as we talked about, it's a 1024 bit uh, um, uh, DSP. It has 248-bit data memory. So with the 2X SIMD uh, compared to uh, Tensilica uh, Q7 and Vision P6 DSP, it translates into 2X performance at the same megahertz. Also, a lot of our customers want to run at a low frequency. Uh, usually, they would run low frequency most of the time and then use a, um, a DVFS, a dynam dynamic voltage and frequency scaling, to go into turbo mode when necessary. So now, because we are running at 1024-bit SIMD, our customer can run this device at even lower frequency than uh, our Q7 and P6. We are also introducing double precision floating point and complex floating point data types. Next couple of slides, I'll talk about uh, the performance improvement we are bringing for AI, computer vision, and floating point. So you will see here that uh, by going to 1024-bit SIMD, we are going to uh, 1024, a 1K 8-bit multiplier accumulator. Uh, we also go to 256, 16-bit multiplier accumulator. And because of that, a uh, lot of these convolution kernels are automatically in, 
uh, giving a close to 2x of performance increase compared to our highly successful Vision Q7 DSP. But not only the convolution, um, uh, this convolution kernel is increasing by 2x, but we looked at some other non-convolution layers. We also looked at some quantization improvement. And by looking at that, some of these other kernels are actually increasing by more than more than 2x, like this LSTM and this other specific kernels. So now, when I look at the computer vision performance here, start, uh, starting with, with this hub transform, Harris, uh, and all these different uh, uh, filter, uh, like uh, Gaussian filter, um, uh, bilinear, bilateral filters, box filters. By going to 1024 SIMD, they are all scaling up nicely to 2x improvement. But then some other improvements that we made, this histogram and uh, uh, this other filter is actually improving by 2x, uh, more than 2x, excuse me. Now, by doubling the floating point performance, this matrix multiplication, this metric inversion, this dot products, they're improving uh, more um, at a 2x compared to over a Q7. But then with the improvement in FFT, this FFT performance is increasing by more than 2x. So what you will see over here that by increasing the SIMD, we have in, uh, improved the performance by 2x for most of the kernel. And then we focused on specific areas that uh, we can improve the performance uh, by more than 2x. So here, this, this chart shows the raw performance uh, comparing Q8 versus Q7. You see the SIMD is double, floating point is double, complex float is extra, multiplier cumulators um, 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 uh, MAC are double compared to Q7. We also offer our customers a multi-core solutions. And with this multi-core solution, um, we have a complete design. So like in this case, they can have a two or a four core in four core, with a 1K machine, they could have a 4K Mac and up, uh, up to approximately 192 gigaflops of floating point performance. So now let me spend a few minutes on our Vision P1 machine. And our Vision P1 machine, as we talked about, a targeted at always on smart sensor, offers 400 giga ops performance. And um, it uh, is uh, offering 192, um, uh, sorry, 128 8-bit uh, Mac. Um, uh, even though it is one fourth SIMD compared to Vision P6, it offers one third area and power uh, 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 compared to Vision P6, but 20% higher frequency. But instruction set is comparable to our Vision P6, same AXI interfaces and advanced DMA, um, uh, similar to our Vision P6, same library like Vision P6, but we also offer TensorFlow Lite micro support um, uh, on our Vision P1. So as we talked about, the area is one third, but then um, um, as um, the SIMD is going one fourth, uh, the, the performance is scaling uh, accordingly, but then the MAC uh, are uh, um, a half, so the performance is scaling accordingly. So again here, this is the raw performance in the floating point and uh, eight bit uh, MAC, the, the eight bit MACs are half. Now this is the maximum performance. Our customers can choose not to, uh, enable all, all this uh, Mac and we provide complete configurability to our customers. Now, uh, we also offer what we call NWA programming model. By offering NWA programming model, our customer can decide to, um, can have the same software going from 128 to 512 to 1024 bit SIMD. Um, we have uh, uh, ISO 262262 readiness for the automotive market. Our IPs are ISO ready, and then customers can de design uh, uh, an SOC that's ISO 262 ready. Now, in terms of the software, we op offer OpenCL, Halide, and OpenVX for computer vision, and our open um, our MADC and OpenCV based XI library and the DMA uh, con and our XOS type of operating system. So, very uh, uh, rich uh, software solution that we provide. And uh, for the for the AI side, we have a neural network compiler that works with Cafe 2, TensorFlow, um, PyTorch, um, and that takes what to fix and can uh, give you the uh, uh, fixed, highly optimized 8 and 16-bit uh, floating point uh, solution. We also have what is called excellency link. So if a customer has their own uh, uh, AI accelerator, then we can um, uh, create the code where some layers can work on their uh, AI accelerator. Uh, and rest of the layers can work on our vision DSP. So on top of 
uh, this vision software and the AI software that I talked about, we all we work with large software partners. We have a, a software partners program where we provide our software partners uh, our uh, uh, soft our development tools free of charge. We provide them support and we provide them uh, um, uh, any anything else that they need to develop the the the, the, the solution. Uh, we also provide them training. Uh, so all these uh, partners who has their imaging or computer vision algorithm uh, have spent time porting that on our DSP. So any customers want access to this algorithm can work with them. We all we work with some other companies uh, like Multicore and Path Partners who have large engineers. So if they provide the services, so if customers want to um, uh, want access to an engineers who knows how to program our DSP, then then that can also be done. Now, so in summary. Um, with a market needs high performance of vision DSP. Um, uh, um, that supports various data type, fixed float, complex float, and entry level, driven by a large number of sensors, high FPS and high resolution. Market also needs low power vision DSP for always on. And today, Tensilka is introducing two DSP. And with this two DSP, we offer a comprehensive vision DSP portfolio from high and 3.8 tops to 400 giga ops. Our flagship vision QA DSP is 1024-bit SIMD. Our Tencel K vision P1 DSP is 128-bit SIMD. And both vision DSPs are based on same SIMD and available architecture and instruction set used by highly successful vision P6 and vision Q7 DSP. Thank you very much for spending time with us. Okay, thank you, uh, Poulin. We'll be going to the Q&A session now. So you can go ahead and, and uh, turn off your screen sharing. And again, a reminder for the audience, if you'd like to ask a question, just go ahead and type it into the, uh, to the little Q&A box at the bottom of your, your Zoom menu there. Um, so thanks for introducing your two new products here at our conference, Poulin. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, you, you supporting, um, Int 8 and Int 16 in, in your Mac units. Do you also support mixed precision on a layer by layer basis? Yeah, it's a good question, um, um, Mike. So this um, is done with our neural network compiler, Xensei Neural Network Compiler, XNNC. And uh, XNNC looks at the accuracy levels, you know, and that how accurate, uh, you, accurate you want the output to be. And depending upon uh, uh, so we, we can set up different accuracy level and depending upon the, what the goal is, you can decide that uh, what uh, uh, eight bit or 16 bit, what uh, precision you want the different layers to run, you know, and this is actually very important when you are trying to decide uh, uh, the, that how accurate um, um, you want your output to run, you know, so we could do that. You know. Okay, good. You also you mentioned something about um, asymmetric quantization. You kind of slipped that in there. I see that that's something that's supported in TensorFlow. Uh, could you explain what uh, asymmetric uh, is? Well, I mean, at a high level, I can explain. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, you're, when you're going um, uh, from a you know floating point uh, to fixed point eight bit, you know that uh, your zero a point and then you know and going uh, that how in both the sides you are you symmetric you know, um, you know or are you are you asymmetric so uh, that depends um, on the the quantization method that you are using to go from float to fix you know and uh, a different um, um, different um, a framework has different requirement uh, so as an ip vendor we have to support uh, uh, both of those are symmetric and asymmetric uh, uh, quantization method, you know, um, and um, um, we need to make sure that uh, uh, we any math that's required, you know, at a high level, any math that's required, we are highly optimized um, in that, you know, and we are not adding any extra overhead uh, related to that uh, um, in terms of uh, math or any type of accumulators and things like that, 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 uh, that if we uncover, you know. And what I read was that it, it actually helps improve the dynamic range, right? Because you've got going from floating point to integer signed uh, uh, eight bit, uh, you can effectively move that point around and 
that's you correct. A bit more range there. Oh, that's a good. Technique. Right. So that is you're absolutely right. So when when you're symmetric, you have chosen saying in the both side of the zeros, you mm -hmm. you it's always symmetric versus you, when it, when it's asymmetric, you are moving your zero point. So then you you can decide based on your data that uh, how good the dynamic range is. So I mean, uh, your point is absolutely correct. Yeah. Great. Uh, so we have some questions from the audience. Um, you, you mentioned that these are all, you know, configurable, and uh, you know what you described as some of the maximum configurations. But it's a question on on having a a P3 with 256 bits SIMD, or or a Q1 with 128. Uh, I think if you see the question there, I think you know really is you you allow any configuration that the customers choose. So you're just describing. The maximum configurations. No, yeah, so okay. So there's some confusion. I I didn't talk anything about P3. This P1 is 128. Yeah. P6 and Q7 are 512 bit SIMD, and one uh, within Q8 is 124 bit SIMD. So those are the width of the SIMDs are fixed, but the configurability comes from. Uh, um, number of Mac you 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 can you want whether you want floating point or not. Uh, whether you want uh, complex or not, and then we have different packages um, uh, for a slam acceleration or not. You know, so there is a lot of those kind of uh, configurations um, uh, that we offer. There are also also configurability for the processor. So at the end of the day, there are a lot of options that the customer has, and depending upon the the problem they're trying to solve or the workload that they want to run, they can decide. You know, in some cases, says you know my workload um, is. Uh, a fixed point heavy, I don't need any floating point. They don't have to choose the floating point and don't spend that extra gates working on it. Or it could be vice versa, it could be more floating point heavy. So depending upon what you're trying to do uh, and you, you you know, but but the idea is to provide configurability to the customer and they what, what customers can do that during the development time, they can have different configuration, play with the workload, and and when they push the production button, then they at that time they can decide what you know what the final final goal is. You know, got it, got it. Provide a lot of flexibility with your IP. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, looking at uh, something like the, uh, the the P1 and and for smart sensors and and IoT, uh, sometimes that raises security concerns. Uh, do you account for that with your IP as well? Yeah, I mean, so we are an instrument to provide a solution, right? You know, so, you know, we, we are providing um, uh, the part of the solution. And in, usually we, we are taking the, the, the image, but then we are not the main controller. Um, uh, of of uh, of the solution, so there is usually some some other controller that's making the decision. That can happen, or in some cases, if we are the main controller and doing the same thing, then uh, there are security things that that can be can be built on. So that is the decision that our um, uh, the SOC maker or the system maker builds into into these things. You know, um, sure. we are providing a solution and saying how it gets implemented. There are hooks for it uh, uh, for the the SOC maker and the system makers to build um, uh, build that. You know. Okay. Um, question on your uh, your Q8 multi core configuration um, is that transparent to the software to the to the developer, and and do you require connecting to a host CPU to make use of that? Yeah, so in, in general, you know, you, you can think of us, whether it's a single core or a multi-core as an offload machine, um, an offload engine. So uh, in, a, in a typical system, uh, there could be a main main controller, you know, whatever happened to be, well, like just for a majority of case, it might be a whole bunch of ARM controllers, there might be other control, other, other things that are sitting there. So, um, um, uh, and then we are an offload engine. So there's always a uh, some kind of a communication method between uh, arm, uh, the main controller and and our multi uh, uh, multi uh, processor uh, cluster. Let's use that word, you know. And mm -hmm. then uh, uh, there could be a dedicated uh, small processor uh, like our our extensor processor that could be 
acting um, as uh, as a main uh, some processor to communicate with the arm or one of the core could be the main main control uh, can be acting as a controller to communicate with that we also provide communication mechanism um, where um, you know it's like something at a high level like a remote procedure call type of a, a communication protocol from this cluster to the main controller we also have a um, a mechanism where the processor to processor communication can be done where uh, the, each of them can synchronize with it. So it's, it's, I just talked about the hardware solution, but we have thought about the mm -hmm. software solution for those communication synchronization. And then we are building the, the proper software stack so that uh, uh, depending upon application, how the customer would do, because the, the customers may have, may have a different requirement. They will have a, a computer vision requirement where they may be running different application or they may be running a, a, an AI where the sing, single uh, AI uh, um, network may be running across all the processor, right? So then the, those kind of a solution can be built in our, our neural network compiler. So, so this is build, giving them a platform and then we build a software solution on top of it um, to give them the, uh, the head start uh, for a, a faster time to market. Hey, let's take a couple more questions from the audience. Uh, there's one about work on uh, the LLVM compiler. Uh, if you see that question it has to do with the, the multi-level uh, IR support, uh, is that something that uh, you're looking at for your software support? Yeah, so so the first is LLVM compiler is is something that's part of our our all our processors. So, um, you know, you know, or our, our DSP is one thing, but you know, Vision DSP is what I'm talking about. But uh, our our Hi-Fi DSP, our uh, uh, communication um, um, uh, DSP, our uh, uh, controller, all of them uh, uh, supports this LLVM compiler. So that's just that's a standard LLVM compiler to uh, uh, take any C code and compile it using an LLVM um, uh, the backend. Um, uh, uh, so that's what uh, we, we we were we were we are talking about, and I think what the the question may be referring to is uh, um, um, uh, machine learning IR ML IR. I think that's what uh, the person may be referring. Okay. Uh, so it is something uh, that um, uh, uh, you know something that we are looking at it. You know, in and I didn't talk about it today because that's not something um, uh, that uh, we, we are supporting, but it's something that we are watching. You know. Got it. Glad you clarified that. Uh, there's a question on uh, whether the DSPs require a dedicated memory subsystem. Well, so all DSPs have their uh, uh, three type of memory, and that's one of the block diagram I kind of touched on it. So mm -hmm. there is a um, uh, instruction memory, instruction cache, and then there is a tightly coupled memory. We call it data memory, and that's where you know those are all sitting next to each. So that, that from there, uh, it runs. Um, you know, it load store is loading and storing from the data memory, and from the instruction cache is where the instructions uh, um, uh, is um, is uh, being loaded. So this is from the strict architecture standpoint. This is the hardware architecture. If you go back to your when Newman versus hardware architecture, your mm -hmm. separate memory uh, and uh, um, a memory for data and instruction. So that that's what this is, you know. And one quick last one then is on the OS support that you have. Sorry, what support, was the question on the OS? The OS support, you, you support a variety of RTOS. Right, so that's the, uh, on, on the, you know, if customers want to uh, do some, any kind of, um, you know, lower level OS, we have our uh, OS is where we call it X, X, X stands for Extensa, Extensa OS is so we provide them where we, they can have a, a single thread, multi-thread OS that we have created, or they can take some OSs uh, um, uh, from the open market and can can work also with our, our platforms, you know, so that's uh, uh, what, what we do. Hey, well, thank you, Poo, and uh, we're out of time, but you'll be in the breakout session later on today, and yep. people can ask more questions there. Thanks again. Uh, thank you very much, Mike, and thanks everyone for attending. Uh, I hope this was useful.